All right, we are live. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Science. This show is jointly hosted by Science for Society, Indian Humanists, South Asian Humanist Association, and Babu Gogineni Humanists and Rationalists Arena Facebook group. I'm Sharat, and joining me today in this episode are Josna Palwai from Chicago and Teja Begari from India. Welcome, Josna and Teja and you all to, his, uh, to this interesting talk show, Let's Talk Science. Thank you, Sharad. Thank you, sir. It's a great pleasure. And today we have a special guest with us. Uh, she's Dr. Stella Kafka. So I'll, I'll give a quick round of introduction uh, of, Dr. of Dr. Kafka. So Dr. Kafka has uh, an outstanding scientific reputation and research track record. She is the chief executive officer of uh, American Meteorological Society and worked as a director at uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers. After obtaining her bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Athens, Greece, she moved to the United States and earned her master's and PhD in astronomy with a double minor in physics and geophysical sciences. There, she also received the Hollis and Greed Johnson Award for excellence in graduate student research. After completing her PhD, Dr. Kafka held a series of prestigious postdoctoral positions and fellowships. First, at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, where she received the National Optical Astronomy Observatory Excellence Award. Then at Caltex Infrared Processing and Analysis Center, IPAC. And as a NASA Astrobiology Institute Fellow at the Carnegie Institution of Washington. As the Executive Director of the AAVSO, which is um, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, Dr. Kafka aspires to build strong communities of professional and amateur astronomers who jointly work towards understanding some of the most dynamic phenomena in the universe. Dr. Kafka resides in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her puppy Ruru when she is not stargazing, managing the variable star observatory or making significant scientific discoveries. She enjoys reading, exercising and traveling. Welcome, uh, Dr. Stella Kafka, to our show. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, so Josna, uh, Josna Garu, would you like to start uh, uh, the show by asking Dr. Kafka? Sure. Uh, I would actually be interested to know Dr. Kafka um, on how she started her, uh, how she got interested in astronomy and her journey uh, to lead uh, so many science institutions and as well as she has been in the forefront of uh, uh, science outreach. Um, more, many girls might be viewing this um, uh, show, so it would be inspiring to them to know her journey. Thank you for, for your question. Uh, my journey to astronomy was a little bit unconventional. Uh, I never had access to clear skies as a child. I grew up in a big city, light pollution and pollution. So the only objects you could see from Athens, Greece, was the, the moon at night, the sun in the morning, and pretty much that's it. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that many of your listeners have a similar experience, lots of light polluted big, big cities. But at the same time, I always loved science. I always loved physics. So I got the, my bachelor's in physics at the University of Athens simply because I wanted to know how nature works. What makes mm -hmm. it tick? How, how, how can, we, can we break it and put it together again? Uh, and physics is fascinating. It shows you all the beauty of physical um, processes around us and how, um, how coordinated uh, nature is and also how uh, different aspects of our lives are affected by nature itself. Uh, so from there, I went to Indiana University for my PhD in astronomy. I was doing a small astronomy project as, a, as an undergraduate student, and this is where I discovered that I really love kind of exploring the world around us. So this way. is where yeah, even from a theoretical standpoint, remember, I was still in a light polluted area and I didn't have access right. to big telescopes. But the first time that I saw the entire night sky, uh, and it was at Kitt Peak uh, in Arizona, uh, it was a dark night, it was, the atmosphere was not even moving, no turbulence or nothing. I fell in love. I'm like, you know something? Uh, this is what I want to do. And I made the right decision. And, you know, in principle, astronomy is physics. 
right? So we're, we're yeah. using the laws of physics to explain the world around us. And, you know, you never, you never look back from there. Um, I, as you mentioned, I've had different uh, positions, um, different research paths, et cetera, uh, I, which took me to the American Association of Variable SAR or to AVSO, where I was doing a lot of outreach, uh, very interested in popularizing science, uh, in uh, communicating science and making sure that we connect the public with scientific projects, those who really want to do sci science, get their hands dirty with data. And now I am at the American Meteorological Society, which is more or less um, a, a society, professional society that works with uh, uh, in the climate, water, weather enterprise. Uh, the mission of the American Meteorological Society is to advance the atmospheric and related sciences, technologies, applications, and services for the benefit of society. So now I'm a little bit more applied. Uh, I'm working towards making sure that good science finds its way to the innovators that are coming up with solutions and keeping people safe. I mean, I would deal with climate change, hazardous um, weather conditions, water sanitation, things like that. So um, not necessarily a straight line, but if not anything else, if I, there's one take home message from that is that be open to opportunities and follow your dreams. And, you know, at some point don't make uh, too many specific plans in your life you never know what life is going to throw at you and how you can take advantage of that and, and grow as a person and help uh, the world around you it appears that your uh, message is that don't be afraid uh, to explore things and then take it forward absolutely a hundred percent don't be even afraid to feel uncomfortable i mean mm. uh, every time that uh, you you made a, a you make a different move in your life or career, there's going to be this fear of, you know, uh, of the unknown, right? right. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Dr. Stella, I mean, um, you worked uh, for American Association of Variable Star Observers uh, mm -hmm. in the past. you enabling um, collection and archival of observations and also like mm -hmm. strengthening collaboration between both amateur uh, astronomers and professional astronomers, right? Mm -hmm. So what would you tell to the curious minds uh, are some of the benefits of the citizen science? Do you have any interesting stories that uh, that you think are a result of uh, citizen science? Actually, I can tell you that citizen scientists are some of the most careful scientists I've ever met and more rigorous. Uh, these are individuals whose uh, life does, and, and employment does not depend on producing science and coming up with papers and, and teaching and coming up with more papers, etc. So the, the publish or perish that we have in academia does not apply to them. So what that means is mm -hmm. that they can capture a problem that has been around for a long time and be rigorous and careful in uh, collecting data and analyzing it and actually come up with really great answers, mm -hmm. answers mm -hmm. that scientists bring uh, in their own work afterwards, professional scientists. So I guess it's, see, I think that we're all scientists, right? So <laughs> professional scientists would take the results of non-professional scientists in their own research. So there's a synergy there, how we push science forward be between citizen scientists and professional scientists. I guess that uh, in my mind, there two types of scientists, those mm. who are getting paid to do science and those who are mm. not getting paid to do science. To do so, science. <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of amazing contributions exactly because of the careful work that mm. individuals who consider astronomy or any uh, scientific field as a hobby, as a passion, uh, mm. are making every day. And things that professional scientists miss because they just don't have the time to, to right. dig much much deeper in a problem high respect everywhere yeah. we have teja right in front of us who is a standing yes. example of what one can do as being part of citizen science yeah. and um how do, and actually uh just a plug in uh teja was the youngest and still is the youngest avso oh. ambassador we've had at the avso um, nice. And that is because he's so accomplished and so smart that nice. we could not not have him as another one. <laughs> so we're really very, very 
uh, fortunate to for him to join our family early on in his career. There are lots of there's lots of promise there, and mm. I'm looking forward to following his career. I bet. Um, Thank you very much. Um, that means a lot for me. Yeah. Congratulations, Teja. Thanks again. And Dr. Kafka, one curious question. So you might have um, billions of data, um, millions of data points, right, from all these uh, citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, filter uh, or how do you um, make sense of um, meaningful information from these data points? Yeah, this is, uh, this is always a big challenge that we have here, so, right? Uh, so there are two different things that are going on with the data. The data is submitted to the AVSO database, and then it's being um, checked by a group of uh, volunteers that are led by AVSO staff to make sure that data, uh, that there are no small mistakes that we can actually capture right away. The, the mistakes that I'm mentioning have absolutely nothing to do with the observers' capabilities, things happen, especially if you're using instruments uh, that are automatic, you know, glitches in the software happen, mistyping of a number might happen, things like that. So we want to make sure that everything like that is, is uh, captured before the data goes to the database. And there are lots of times where AVSO staff contact the observers to, to actually ask them to check a couple of things in their, in their data acquisition software and perhaps resubmit their data. The second has to do with how the data um, disseminated and used by those who are interested in specific research projects. Uh, and the AVSO has databases that actually curate that data long-term, both mm -hmm. for um, variable stars and for the sun. Remember this, our sun, our own little star is a variable star itself. So mm -hmm. there is a very rich database of solar data there. Uh, and from there on, researchers can actually come and download the data for free and use them for their own uh, for their own purposes. And actually, sometimes individuals are using the data stand alone, ABS mm -hmm. or data stand alone, or they combine them with data acquired either with satellites or with uh, um, at different wavelengths with different kind of um, equipment. So the ABS or databases says and now there's a spectroscopy database as well are a great resource yeah. that bring all this this wealth of data come from citizen science to the professional community to actually help uh, push science forward this is a complementary database or it's a database standalone that can actually produce great science and there's not enough researchers to, to mm. study all those stars so there's lots of future there if people want to actually study. Uh, by, by researchers, by the way, I mean both professional uh, astronomers, students and their teachers, and anyone else who might want to be involved with a small research project. Thank you. Um, Shri, do you want to take, I, I actually have one more, like um, on the, now that you are leading or you have you are holding an executive position at American mm -hmm. Meteorological Society. Uh, I just want to touch on uh, climate change related things. So we, um, in the recent um, intergovernmental panel on climate change report, it uh, it's mentioned that we, we only have um, uh, 10 years to reduce this uh, global carbon emissions by 50%. And that um, to revert this um, catastrophic uh, planetary warming of uh, three degree foreign heat, right? Now we are seeing uh, the impact of this uh, climate change in real time um, playing in the form of um, several extreme weather events, right? Now, yeah. what kind of agencies do we need to address this urgency? pretty much anyone, anyone, anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, climate change is not something that one country or one agency can address by themselves. It's the whole world. It's something that is affecting everybody. Uh, it's not that, you know, perhaps here in the US or in India, people locally can decide to take action 
and they will get rid of the effects of climate change momentarily. We all need to come up with a, a much more concise and much more unified strategy uh, and actually act on it. And this is mm -hmm. where we're, we as a planet are failing ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, because no matter what, how many discussions, how many decisions, how many scientific studies or white papers are published out there, we mm -hmm. are very much in danger of not coming up with the required reduction of CO uh, by 2030. 2030 mm -hmm. is an artificial number. Maybe it's going to happen yeah. before that. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, that two, three degrees increase will be temp. Uh, will be permanent we'll have to live with it um mm -hmm. it's not going to be the end of the world in the sense that you know the planet is not going to implode but um we're going to start seeing more extreme phenomena and that might, from historical records we know that has led to both social and societal and environmental changes and i'm not really sure that we are prepared for that so buckle up we're up for a very interesting 50, 100 <laughs> years ahead. I, I, yeah. yeah, I really don't know. Right. I'm just hoping that somehow yeah. we'll all gain the wisdom and act uh, now. No. Yeah. yeah, I hope so. I echo your sentiments. Over to you, Sharad. Uh, thanks, Josnagar. So, uh, Dr. Kafka, um, so um, I think I'll, I'll just take a different route now. Uh, so, um, you you have, I mean, you, you have a stellar resume, I mean, um, if, if we look at it, and uh, you have worked not just as an astronomer, uh, also as, uh, you know, as, as an astrobiology, you, you had, uh, you, you worked, uh, you know, had a career as an astrobiologist, astrobi as, as, as a fellow in astrobiology as well. And mm -hmm. the ge geophysics part, I mean, you, you have, uh, you know, like expertise in all these things. So what's the most exciting thing that you have worked on um, uh, or that, that, that you can uh, think of the first thing that comes to your mind when you look, look at your career, at your research career, or even something that you are doing now? You know, it's like asking a parent to tell you which one of their kids are the favorite. I can't exactly <laughs> tell you that. I love science. I really love everything that they've done. I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I had to work in different places, use different equipment, take my own data, play with it, and also um, work on my own projects like design my own projects and, and find money for them and actually support myself through those funds and, and my science um i can tell you that my very favorite uh, discovery so far not one of mine but my very favorite discovery is the one that hasn't been made yet so i'm really looking for no pressure for the scientists out there I'm really looking forward to the future of science because right now we have so many new technological ca uh, capabilities mm -hmm. that no one knows what's going to happen next. Um, maybe we are going to find some kind of, of uh, life form, perhaps a different sort of life form on a different planet around a, dif around a different star. Maybe we will find the Earth Sun twin somewhere out there maybe we will understand what these nova eruptions are doing and what the progenitors of uh, supernova 1a finally are that we're using as standard candles maybe we will resolve the, the whole cosmological constant thing figure out what the universe is going to be doing is it going to expand collapse play yo-yo i don't know i really don't uh, and and so many different amazing different discoveries within our solar system still people are, are looking for planet x right a planet whose uh, within our solar system has been um, predicted to have some gravitational push pull with our, the rest of our planets, but no one has discovered it. Everybody's theorizing about it, uh, or we'll we'll discover something new about our sun that has data for four hundred years now, and every new solar cycle is surprising us. So we live in a golden era of science. It's it's amazing what we as humans can do. And I am looking forward to what's going to happen next. Now, about my own work, as I said, I love everything I'm doing. And uh, I wish I had the time to work more on science right now. Um, I am at the, the phase of my life and my career where I uh, aspire to support science. 
aspired to make to open doors and make sure that individuals who are working in science have avenues to communicate it, avenues to actually publish it, ways to come together and discuss about scientific advances and build collaborations, but also make sure that science comes to your everyday people because it does affect their life. And it's pretty much all the scientific advances that we're making is for us to make the world and our lives better. So um, scientists at heart and explorer deep inside, and I'm looking forward to what's gonna happen in the future. I know I'm not answering directly to your question, but frankly I, I can't choose that's the bottom line <laughs> so dr kafka then um, and so 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 you have a career as a scientist and you also have a career as a leader as a mentor and uh, mm -hmm. as 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 a vocal uh, proponent in your leadership for 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 a lot of uh, inclusion in 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 scientific mm -hmm. research and in leadership as well so um would, uh, what kind of satisfaction did you um, or um, you know fulfillment this did this uh, these kind of initiatives have uh, brought into you, and uh, what uh, do you want to talk something about about those initiatives that you took as a leader? I do believe that um, so in in my life, my career, my work, my everything that I do, I do believe that diverse voices are making everything that we do, including quality of life, much more rich, much more complete, and much better overall. Um, I, I do recognize that there have been uh, groups of individuals that have not been provided traditionally the same opportunities. I do understand that nowadays um, talking about equality, equality is not enough. We need to talk about equity, not only the opportunities we provide, but also what the background of individuals are, how we can actually help them uh, reach their potential because they're different and uh, because we really want them to grow and, and uh, provide the best they can be in our society. Uh, for me, supporting women in science, um, promoting girls and providing them with opportunities is a big component of everything I do simply because women, girls traditionally have not had the opportunities or the role models or actually even a discussion about science in their everyday lives or even at school. Um, and from there on, I hope that we will all learn how to respect and uh, work with each other in order to actually make our world a better, a better place. You know, there are lots of times where people are asking, so why do we need, like, uh, you know, uh, diverse people in the workplace, for example? Uh, and I tell them, okay, listen, if if we hire five individuals that are exactly like me, they will be able to do exactly what I do, which mm -hmm. is not anything different, right? We're not getting yeah. anything from that. What we need to do actually is make sure that we have around us individuals that are different than us, because this is how we learn. This is how we grow. This is going to be uh, the, the roots for innovation. And it's going to be much more fun. I mean, if, if I want to hire me, just talking to myself in the mirror is so boring. <laughs> I don't learn anything. I'm not going anywhere. So uh, for me, actually interacting with individuals from all over the world and learning from them is, is a priority always. And I think it's interesting that, you know, um, uh, that, you know, you, you mentioned um, how women are access uh, to uh, how women are, you know, don't have that much access to uh, scientific thinking as uh, in the way they are brought up um, in, in societies. And because um, your field, astronomy, um, was pretty much um, pioneered by um, Henriette Haswan Levitt. So her work on, um, I mean, she established the standard candle. So anything uh, pretty much, you know, if, if we are looking anything beyond our five planets, or even the planets of the solar system, if you're looking at stars and trying mm -hmm. to measure distances. It's a hard work that pioneered the whole thing. And it's and it's not even like, I, th I think it's like what, 100 years before, uh, 100, 120 years ago that she did this work. And she was mm -hmm. paid, um, and she, she did not, uh, she was not uh, like a research scientist in, in, the, in, the, in the Harvard Observatory, I think, where she did. And uh, she received mm -hmm. credits for graduate school work for her work, which pioneered the field. 
and then <laughs> she and then she was paid um, like what ten dollars an hour or something, which is e- in in today's uh, equivalent uh, amount. So e- this itself is a case uh, the fight you know for uh, despite despite pioneering the field. Uh, this is I mean we, we don't even recognize so much, and even today uh, when when you look at it, I mean and leadership in. Um, uh, for for uh, no, for women in STEM and science and your field and uh, in general uh, in other fields also. Um, so being a leader, uh, being a leader, you know, uh, and a scientist who's also a woman. Um, do you think uh, in your career, in your course of career, uh, there have been some barriers that have been broken by people like yourselves, or uh, or what kind of challenges did you face? Uh, uh, you know, in in that sense, and then. What kind of barriers did you break, and what kind of barriers did do you think in your generation men have broken um, towards becoming leaders in STEM? Where do I start from? Uh, you know, Henrietta Levin was one example. I, let me tell you the example of the most important scientist or the most important astronomer of the twentieth and twenty first century. And that is Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin. She was at the Harvard Observatory as well at some point. And what uh, she did was um, she analyzed light from stars through photographic plates and she discovered that the sun and other stars are made primarily of hydrogen and helium. Up to that point, we believe that everything in the universe, including our sun, was made of elements very similar to the Earth. So similar to our atmosphere, similar to our soil. And she discovered something different. And actually uh, when that was part of her thesis and her thesis advisor advised her not to publish that result because it's ridiculous. Uh, and of course, a couple of years later, someone else made the same discovery and they, oh yes, of course, absolutely, it's, it's right. She did publish her thesis, by the way. It, was the mo- it is the most influential thesis ever made in astronomy. Um, Barriers are everywhere, and they are. Uh, some of them are in your face, as in, you know, why am I not being given the same opportunities to go to conferences, or I'm not meeting the same individuals as my male colleagues. And some of them are subconscious. It's it's a way that individuals are addressing you. It's a, it's a way that um, expectations happen from fili- from female astronomers and male. Um, it's a way that you're addressed at conferences. It's a way that you're addressed when you're giving a, a presentation. And it is, it does have to do with uh, expectations of who you are and what you're doing. Uh, I'll tell you the story. A couple of years ago, no, before COVID, my goodness, uh, more than a couple of years ago, I was giving a presentation uh, in front of a group of like 400 people on astronomy research. Um, and usually I, I'm having a lot of fun when I'm giving talks uh, and I really love communicating science. At the very end of, the, of my presentation, um, a male colleague of mine came and said, you know, you're very smart for a woman. And I was like, excuse me? And he said, but you know what I mean? I said, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what exactly is that meant to be? Um, so uh, things like that, it's, it's lots of uh, passive aggressive comments, a lot of, of uh, uh, lowered expectations, a lot of kind of, uh, so right now, I think that we as a society and as a scientific community have become much, much better understanding how we need to even address each other in a respectful way so that in a professional environment, we're all equal. We're all listening to each other. We're having the same conversations. And if not, if we make a faux pas in our address, we recognize it and we learn from it and we move past it and even apologize. So um, as women, even minorities in science, it's not just females, that is the the unfortunate thing here. Um, As women and minorities in science, we have made some progress when it comes to finding our our rightful way in uh, the scientific community and in our society as well. We still have work to do. And that is why it's really important for all of us to at least keep pushing forward until we don't have to have a conversation about about, um, conduct, about quality of work, about anything that is related to gender or race or 
enter <laughs> uh, enter term. I think it's interesting that you know uh, this 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 I think this uh, story that you uh, narrated where uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know this man came up to you and said you must be you are you are smart for for you know for a woman. Mm -hmm. So I think in 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 Indian culture there is there is this other side of the attitude where. Uh, someone say you know someone has a career orientation. Some uh, you know a, a woman has a career orientation. They would ask you. They would tell eh, you you are very well balancing your your personal and professional life. Where the personal life balance is all about you know doing household chores. So there are I mean so there are societies where still women are you know expected to do this. And and more famously there was this film. Um, so so in, uh, so uh, as you are aware you know India has a, a, a huge. Um, a big, uh, you know, a rocketry scene uh, with with ISRO, with Indian Space Research Organization, where you know yeah. uh, they send out, um, um, you know, probes to study planets. So, so there was there was uh, there was this project to study the Mars, and it was called Mangalyan, um, and uh, and and this was made into a film. And in the film, um, so in fact, actually, there were many leaders uh, in this project who were women, who were you know scientists who were women. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, in this in this film, it, it was shown that you know, uh, so this leader, you know, this scientist uh, who's a woman, so she does the research and she goes home and cooks meals. So when when you see, I mean, so do, do you think our cultural portrayals, you know, in art of uh, women in this kind of attitude, where uh, oh, or, or, all right, you can you can work. I mean, you you can have a career, but you also have to do this. Uh, and this is specifically done only for women. I mean, no one really expects a a male sci scientist, I mean, to, to take care of kids. And they would say mm. uh, something like, you know, this guy is busy doing this. Uh, why would he take care of kids? I mean, this kind of attitude is so, uh, is, is still yeah. persisting in society. So how it's... would you, uh, how would you look at this? And what would you, I mean, if, if, if young girls who are watching this and listening to you uh, on, if, if they get if, into this kind of, they, they, they are going to, how do you think they should be prepared to receive this kind of thing um, in the future? They are going to receive this kind of thing, but uh, what would you say and how would you look at this kind of uh, attitude? I hear what you're saying. In a perfect world, uh, this kind of stereotypes would cease to exist. Actually, in a perfect world, what you want movies and whatever to portray is both individuals, you know, men and women going home and raising the kids, yeah. being there for their children, <laughs> being an active, active members of their family. I mean, you're having a family because you want to, to raise balanced citizens of the world. You want to teach them something for a better future, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you do, cooking can be something that people enjoy doing. Okay. But if it's an obligation, as in, you know, I am going to have a full-time job, but as a female, I'm expected to go home and clean the whole house and cook for everybody and take care of whatever and do laundry. It's just, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And that does two things for, for people, for society. The first one is those expectations that the women should traditionally take care of the household where men, men's job is much more important and contribution is much more important. So they should be left alone. Uh, and actually that's not fair for men either. You know, again, if you want to spend time with your family, if you want to cook for your family, you want to clean the house, et cetera, you should be doing it. Uh, and the second one is, is creates, um, it creates impossible role models for women. Yeah. There is no way you can be excellent in your job and you can be satisfying all the needs of the household. There are 24 hours in a day and you're only human. So it's an extra pressure that leaves women with this lack of satisfaction on uh, both on the personal and the professional lives. And that leads to a very unhappy life. So we really need to start kind of realizing that um, of what kind of choices we have, what kind of choices we make. Uh, when I was in graduate school and I was working actually 20 hours a day, there were times where I just would go home and Thanks. sit on the, on the couch all weekend and not clean the house. And that's okay, right? And I was living by myself, just a disclaimer. But at, at that time, you know, if you were to visit my, my place, you'd be like, what is all the dust here? Well, guess what? I've been working 20 hours a day for the full week, including weekends. There's time, you know, for 
for decompression, right? We're, we're only human. Me getting sick would not help anyone. So um, I think that the key to that, apart from a change in uh, a change in mentality and a change in role models in terms of the conversation that we're having uh, for women is to actually have a partner uh, who is understanding and who, und who respects the most people. Uh, a person who is not exactly a traditional individual has this kind of expectations and they realize that the partnership being a, a relationship is something that is that needs to be satisfactory for both uh, and we both need to pull our weight and that's exactly what's happening in my life actually I'm very very part of um, very proud and very fortunate to have met a, a man who is helping not helping we live together right? we both live in this house uh, yeah. so pulling his way while i'm pulling mine um, and yeah again both of us are professionals and we are we have a lot of work and there are times where no one empties the dishwasher it's fine <laughs> no one cleans the house it's fine just you know give ourselves a little bit of slack goes a long way both for physical and for mental health Hopefully the yes. day comes soon when we don't discuss uh, this question of uh, <laughs> balancing uh, both career and personal life. Which is which is portrayed in a very condescending way of you know saying that you know women are great multitaskers. <laughs> uh, you know, let me burst that bubble because <laughs> I've done my best work when I didn't have to multitask, where I could actually focus on one thing and concentrate there. Otherwise, I've never been satisfied with what I was doing. It's it's too much of a distraction. Really. Absolutely. I mean, there's no such thing called uh, multitasking in the truest sense. I mean, just work, you work, take take something to a logical end, and then come back to something else. And there's a lot of switching time involved. <laughs> you get your things get lost. So, Shirith, your question brings me uh, uh, makes me add one more thing: uh, the communication aspect, right? Uh, in that particular movie, where um, the scientist was portrayed to come home and cook back, right? That also has something uh, some uh, something to do with the way we communicate, uh, both in portraying the art and as well as. Uh, communicating science, right? So, uh, Dr. Kafka, we at Science for uh, Science for Society have been working towards publicizing science and also work towards a greater understanding of science mm -hmm. engagement in the public life and culture. We uh, we have been creating platforms for science communicators where they can uh, present topics. Um, so you have been at the forefront of uh, science outreach activities and you have been um, a manager um, pub, uh, for many journals, right? So in your experience, uh, what has been, uh, what have been the best approaches that you think can better the science communication? Ooh. Anything and everything that you, uh, you can think of and it changes. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna show my age if I tell you that when I was in graduate school, we didn't have Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, technology again surprises us and it enables us to connect. Uh, look at this, we're talking to on Zoom, right? And we are different parts of the world at different time zones. And yet we feel that we are around a, a table and I'm having my tea here and we're having tea all I together. Think 70 it's, years, it's, I think 70 years ago, a lot of science publications were done in German, not even mm -hmm. in English. So. <laughs> Lots of, and you know, 100, 300 years ago, it was all happening in Latin and Greek and yeah. because that was the, the scientific language. So we were moving forward. I do remember as a graduate student, I was going to the library, you know, a big room with lots of books and journals. And I was actually flipping through journals to find the article of interest. And right now you just click, click, click. You don't even have to move from your couch to actually do the same thing. Um, when it comes to communication, things are advancing. They're advancing really fast. The challenging part is actually to keep up with them. 
<laughs> depending on the audience that you want to reach out to you want to reach a younger audience or a, a much more mature audience you need to understand how they are used to communicate uh, different generations use different things and again i'm going to show my age by saying that i am on facebook and um my my niece told me like you know you you must be old you know, old to be on facebook <laughs> <laughs> nine, okay, nine years old really so it's that is a challenge when it comes to outreach when it comes to communication when it comes to connection building communities right how do people want to connect that's one and the second one we the the advance of technology with the advance of all these possibilities that we have threats come in as well right so um suddenly we've been immersed in the whole idea of trolls who are just causing trouble online and through our communities just because that's because it's fun whatever um, so how do you make sure that the community stays focused and respectful in their interactions respect is extremely important and you don't have individuals who want to cause harm um kind of interfere intervene and break trust amongst members so yeah uh, my favorite mode of communication frankly is in person i love meeting people in person unless for the last two and a half years it hasn't been possible but again i'm really grateful for zoom yeah yeah platforms like this uh, Teja, would you like to ask Dr. Dr. Kafka anything before we move to uh, another other topic? Yeah, but uh, like kind of technical questions related to climate change and a little bit of citizen science. Mm -hmm. uh, so the this question is, what kind of tools do uh, meteorologists use other than the satellite uh, thing uh, to know about the sky or know about the weather to be precise? So what kind and what exactly is done in the American Meteorological Society uh, and how do you uh, collect the data of the climate change and, and erratic weather patterns? So how exactly is basically done and what other kinds of techniques are used other than satellites? There are actually satellites quite recent. It's uh, the more I get involved with uh, the American Meteorological Society and the scientists that are involved in there, the more I'm amazed by the the crazy ways that people are collecting data. So one of the very important things, climate change is something that we have been monitoring for decades, and it's something that uh, anthropogenic climate change, right? Uh, and it's something that is very well documented by monitors all over the world, and we're still documenting it both from ground-based sources and from, from space. Um, one of the very urgent and very urgent focal points, let me say that, uh, of uh, climate and weather scientists is actually try to, trying to find techniques of predicting uh, hazardous weather way in advance in order to let people know, uh, especially when it comes to conditions that are very unusual, that could cause floods, that could cause um, hurricanes or eventually loss of life. What you really want to do is at least let, let communities know that something is coming way in advance and try to protect them, right? Just try to minimize loss of, of life and property if possible. Uh, there are so many different techniques. I mean, um, my atmospheric scientists friends are just grabbing their equipment where there's a storm coming and they're going towards the storm to take information about the storm. It's actually insane. People used to fly in the eye of hurricanes. So you have this big weather front that is happening and they want to get more data, they grab a plane, and fly through it. And it's insane, right? And they survive to tell the story. Um, now, of course, we, we use drones and there are other kinds of techniques to do something like that, but they still do it. And again, the more data that you're collecting from different locations would help inform models uh, theoretical models that help us understand a little bit how the atmosphere works, how the earth, uh, how the atmospheric, different atmospheric layers um, com community interact with different parts of the planet, how changes uh, even in uh, infrastructure here on earth affect local climate. I mean, when you're building a, a skyscraper, when you're building tall buildings, that changes actually the air the 
the flow of air within that particular city. So it cre creates a different sort of microclimate. It's such, I thought the universe was complicated. <laughs> well, let's stick to our own little planet. That is extremely complicated. Uh, and exactly because all those uh, models advice, again, try to keep people uh, really safe. Um, that is why this particular work that scientists from the uh, American Meteorological Society are doing uh, is extremely, extremely urgent and important. Uh, one of the ways that we are facilitating, so as a, a professional society, we have a whole bunch of activities that help bring those individuals together. We don't have databases. There's so many databases out there that it wouldn't make sense to actually try to be, bring data together. What we have is journals that, we, that allow, actually very high profile journals that allow the scientists to um, write up their science and disseminate and share it with other people. We have several meetings, both topical and much more general, where individuals come together and discuss different scientific aspects. We have webinars, we have online webinars, both for professional atmospheric scientists, but also for those who want to learn. So there, there's so much interest when it comes to weather. I mean, um, even my next door neighbor has a weather station. I mean, why not? You can do it. There's a small little kit. Um, you can do it very easily. And we're all interested in what the weather looks like, right? So it's, there are lots of people who really want to learn more about uh, how science is being conducted in different aspects, again, of the weather, water, climate enterprise. We have a very rigorous accreditation program, and that is one of the things that is much more focused here in the U.S. Um, when uh, local <clears throat> local um, teachers and uh, broadcast meteorologists can get uh, their credit, the, cred the credential, let's say, that actually counts for the towards the career, etc. We have a very, very rich educational program that is teaching pretty much teachers how to speak about uh, climate change, different aspects of weather, different aspects of water. Water, so I remember, most of the earth is full of water, right? Uh, so that is part of our ecosystem, part of uh, who we are and what affects us. So there's lots of activities that we have uh, across the board of the AMS. And through those activities, we're both uh, helping scientists produce as much science as they can. <clears throat> we also have a very active policy program where we are producing reports that eventually go to politicians. And actually, this is open to everyone all over the world because those aspects are extremely important everywhere again. Um, so these are ways that we are <coughs> we're helping citizens to actually learn more about uh, uh, items that are uh, scientific um, uh, uh, subjects that they're interested in and help scientists come together and produce um, this and, and produce and promote and learn uh, from science um, or scientific advancements. We also have a group of individuals from industry. So the a AMS is a very interesting professional society in that it brings together academia, government and industry, those who come up with solutions that are being uh, driven by climate change. So there's a uh, climate change, weather and all the data comes out. So it's a very, very wide range of activities for a very, very rich and very diverse community. Uh, yeah, it really shows sure that it's a very diverse community. Everywhere. <laughs> I can keep talking, but you know, I think that you get the point here. Yeah. You see. And well, because uh, it is today's uh, uh, World Environment Day, uh, how well is climate related to environment and uh, how well is, say the good climate affects uh, the environment and how both of them are interlinked well the environment is the world around us climate is one of the things that affects it right so they're they're interconnected and you're like studying the environment you're studying climate through studying the environment that's the bottom line yeah. He's studying um, weather. Yeah. Uh, what are the main reasons you believe uh, are say for the anthropogenic global warming? The name itself says, but what what uh, what are the main reasons uh, to the global warming? Global warming, other than uh, the pollution and uh, 
say basically the pollution what are the other reasons um, i'm going to tell you what science tells us <laughs> what i believe is relevant um, and i believe in science by the way so science tells us that anthropogenic uh, climate change is driven by all the activities that we're we're having in our everyday life from flying planes to industry to you know using our car all the time so or even uh, creating trash like in abundance so uh, based on that we just need to do our part <laughs> and reduce those activities as much as possible that's as much as i can tell you without getting into very excruciating <laughs> And my last question from my side is, it's out of my interest. Uh, are there any kind of citizen science projects uh, one can do at the AMS? Uh, like, are there any kind of citizen science projects uh, one can do with the help of, uh, say, uh, on climate change or how can one understand them and do projects related to climate change? To be more precise, the citizen science projects at the AMS. So we don't, we don't have projects, projects per se. What we have is webinars and information. So if you want to learn more about uh, different aspects of weather, water, and climate, um, we have what we call a weather band. It's a, a series of webinars where we get to actually talk to scientists who are doing specific sciences. So the, one of the latest ones was on lightning which is super, super interesting because if we don't think about lightning as a source of energy and or as a hazard for, uh, for us, and yet it actually causes a lot of trouble. Um, so the, it was uh, on weather band there. So we are producing mostly information. Um, there are citizen science projects through other organizations that are targeting individuals to collect data and or analyze different uh, different types of data, but not through the AMS. We're focused on disseminating science and making sure that we are uh, helping people get the information they need the way they need it. Um, scientific literacy is extremely important for all of us at every level. Of, uh, of the society. Uh, so, Dr. Pafakov, we have been talking about uh, you know the climate change and uh, you know uh, the, the the need to act upon it, um, it hastily because we don't have much time, and a decade of uh, and decade you know to do a lot of things is uh, when when we look at it politically and when we even broaden the scope to geopolitics, geopolitics it becomes very difficult to get things done. Uh, within such, such short span of time, given uh, you know all the stakeholders you know involved and all that, so and despite that, uh, the the uh, do you see denial of climate change is among um, um, especially in in circles in, in political circles where uh, there is authority involved and there is a lot of power involved and there is a lot of decision making involved that is hinged upon this myth that you know this denial of climate say climate change and making people believe you know because it be useful uh, to, to exercise decision do you think that is a, a big hindrance to do whatever is needed uh, to, uh, to to offset the climate change effects across the world do you think that's 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 a that, that that's that's there you know if you don't believe in something then you won't do anything about it right so the bottom line is that yes, all this uh, disbelief, as if you know, science needs you to believe of anything. Science is data driven. When we read, we just follow what data tells us. And granted, with time, the data acquisition techniques and our knowledge of how to analyze it uh, have improved, so we get better data. Um, there are there where there still are deniers of climate change. But you know something, no one can deny that um, we have more, more wildfires than we ever had before. We have more tornadoes than we ever had before. We have more random, bizarre weather um, phenomena that we ever had before. And they affect us and they affect our livelihood and they affect our lives and they affect the way we interact with each other. They affect our travel and they affect our work. So, 
in as much as you know people don't believe quote unquote in climate change experiencing the outcome of climate change is un undeniable uh, here in the us last year alone we had about 20 to 25 billion dollar disaster outcomes so each one of them caused more than one billion dollar to recover and we still haven't recovered so it's the, the the outcomes of this erratic weather the outcomes of climate change right now is affecting our economy it's affecting mm -hmm. the way we live it's affecting people's health it's affecting uh people's uh, food production and it's definitely disruptive when it comes to uh com to um transfer of goods so if you have all those floods in one part of the u.s for example and you have wildfires on the other trucks won't be able to travel between coasts goods won't be able to go between coasts if you have tornadoes non-stop on one part of the uh, on the united states the boat the ships won't be able to to dock uh, goods won't be able to come and think about being on a plane, right? <laughs> so we're talking about disruption in our everyday life. So believing or not believing climate change right now is completely relevant because it's real. Um, and and this is, uh, I think what you, you, I think you pretty much stated uh, a plain fact, you know, out loud. Um, uh, but would you think, uh, you know, the, the propaganda, uh, the pseudoscientific propaganda or this kind of propaganda that is politically motivated uh, is being done in a very sophisticated manner these days. In earlier days, I mean, these are the, I mean, uh, the lobbyists are, you know, those are the journalists who um, write about climate science denial or who, uh, you know, write, liter publish literature about this climate science denial. They are not like, uh, you know, the crystal healers. They don't say, you know, trust in this and believe us and this will happen. So they are, uh, they're constructing this argument in a very sophisticated manner. For example, they have papers uh, to cite, you know, either these could be false positives or this could be having publication bias. And, you know, there could be a bunch of reasons why these uh, papers even came into uh, print, uh, came into existence. But they would, you know, uh, get these, you know, papers and they, they start, you know, writing uh, based on these, citing these. And in your career, you worked, uh, you also worked as a journal manager. So would you see this is a rampant issue in, uh, I mean, in, in publications? And if, and this is not just, may not be just limited to climate science. Climate science is a very hot topic where it's misused a lot, where it's used a lot. And even in uh, alternative uh, medicine, like homeopathy or even uh, vaccine hesitancy, a lot of these things which are anti-science and which are against uh, the scientific consensus uh, are being actually you know, driven uh, through sophisticated arguments that refer to these papers. Uh, do you see that 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 issue is there, and uh, and uh, and do you see, do you think you know skeptics, uh, scientific skeptics who and bloggers, you know, who write for public understanding of science, need to be vigilant about this? And what do you think the way we should combat this kind of sophisticated nonsense, fashionable nonsense? You know, um, in the publishing world, one of the big services that scientific like reputable scientific journals pro provides to science is the peer review process it's a process where a manuscript is going to anonymous referees more than one uh, who are experts on the field and ask them their opinion uh, on on the content and the, whether the scientific method has been adequately followed uh, the right data is being collected, the right models are being um, constructed in order to reach a specific uh, conclusion in the paper. Now, what we have in, uh, sadly, on this planet is what we call predatorial journals. These are journals that just, and, and publications that publish anything. So if you pay them, they're going to just publish things without even considering the scientific field integrity of the content, even the correctness of the content, and the, the data that is being um, collected, etc. Now, these type of journals are very well known. And that is why scientists prefer to actually, every scientist will go to journals that are reputable, 
journals like the ones that the American Meteorological Society is publishing, they, where they trust and they know that their science is not going to be misinterpreted and or be among random stuff. Now, you're right. There are lots of individuals who are um, there are lots of individuals who are taking advantage of that and they're just promoting their own beliefs as being scientific proof. Predators always existed in, in society. Um, I think that these, the fact that they, those individuals exist, and I'm pretty sure that they're serving their own interests one way or another, because this information is not just for this information's sake. There's something behind that. There's some kind of interest. Uh, usually it's financial. Usually it's uh, controlling opinions. Usually it's uh, seeking power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those individuals, again, exist. And in principle, there's nothing we can do to make them stop. The one thing, though, we can do in order to fight that kind of war against information is to make sure that work that you are doing um, is upfront and center and appreciated and it's augmented as much as possible. In other words, to make sure that individuals have access to science and they are provided that information the way they understand it. It's true that scientists use a lot of jargon. Jargon exists in every profession, right? Even mm -hmm. if you're a medical doctor, if you're a gardener, if you are a builder, you have your own jargon. Um, but what that means is that this is a, a set of words that only you and your colleagues can understand and not everybody else. Um, scientists, we have a huge responsibility to communicate the outcomes of our uh, research to everybody. Because the bottom line is that the reason why we're doing research is to improve everybody's life, right? Our everyday life, it's not science for the sake of science. It's, it's information in order to create a better world, in order to create better products, in order to promote technology, et cetera, et cetera. So you're making an excellent point in that, yeah, there are people who are taking advantage all over the world for taking advantage of misinformation, well, the one way to re reverse that is to actually explain science to individuals and try to instill as much trust on data and the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kafka, while it's... we are on this topic of uh, pseudoscience, I just want to uh, touch upon uh, astrology. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm um, not sure about U.S. and other parts, but ba uh, back in India, um, it's um, astrology um, and the religious market, spiritual and religious market, um, has grown disproportionately. I mean, uh, people uh, usually have a natural tendency to know about the future, right? So in this process of um, wanting to know um, a chance of getting a job or maybe um, how, how, how their marriages last or when to make uh, investments. So they reach out to the astrologers um, to make some decisions, right? So um, in the, they think that um, astrology is built on the foundation that a relationship exists between um, the celestial um, celestial bodies like influence th there may be influence of stars zodiac signs on us right so as an ast astrophysicist do you um, believe or is there any truth to that uh, to that celestial bodies affect our everyday aspect of our lives you know um we're talking about beliefs here and about religion, and that is a completely different story. Uh, what mm -hmm. people believe is a very personal issue, right? And mm -hmm. what they trust. Uh, there is no scientific proof that astrology has any effect on people's lives. And I can tell you that one celestial object, the sun, is the only thing that affects our lives in the sense that you know it provides heat, it provides vitamin D, and it keeps us safe and it keeps us happy every day. Nothing to do with any gravitational push-pull or whatever. 
um, just the fact that we need we need an energy source to survive. Um, it is very interesting. I had the opportunity to teach undergraduate astronomy, astronomy when I was in uh, when I was in Indiana at the beginning of my career, and uh, I would dedicate a full hour on how we cast our horoscope. What on earth is a horse? I mean, how astrologers work. And the first thing mm -hmm. that we talk about is that the, uh, the zodiac uh, that we have right now, especially in the, in the Western world, um, was built by Babylonians, ancient Babylonians. So this is something that has been around for 4,000 years. Now, having said that, the Earth's axis, if the Earth is rotating around its axis, right? The Earth's axis right. is not stable. It's moving and it has a, mm -hmm. what we call precession. It has this precession mm -hmm. period of 27,000 years. So mm -hmm. within those 4,000 years, the skies that we see throughout the year is different. So mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the zodiacs that are connected to months of the year or were connected to months of the year 4,000 years ago, completely different than what's happening right now. So here's an example, right? We're using an ancient system to explain today's world, mm. not even taking into account that it's, it's a different, different view of the sky, right? Uh, so someone even I, came up with the thirteen zodiac sign, uh, just 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 to it? make. I don't know. Someone came in. Uh, you know, there, there are twelve zodiac signs, right? So there was a proposition. You know, there was a proposal uh, to bring oh, 13. Uh, a thirteen, of yeah, interest. thirteen zodiac sign. Yes, to compensate oh, the whole. I remember thing. that. I remember I was I was still in Greece when that happened, and you know there was a, a big panic amongst astrologers. Like, it's not up to you whether there's another constellation. Actually, we have eighty-eight constellations in the night sky. So yeah. doesn't it look a little bit arbitrary to choose the ones you want and not to choose the ones we you don't <laughs> like? And God forbid. So it, it, so again, um, as with religion, astrology is something that people believe. And I'm, I'm gonna go back to what you mentioned at the very beginning of your question, actually. And this is the fact that people are really uh, afraid of uncertainty. People really want to know what's happening in the future. People want to know that there's, there's some safety in the future. There's some, something that is predictable, something that they follow because it's meant to be that and that is why they go to astrologers and that's why they go to tarot readers and that's why um you know palm reading is very popular and you know people really read their horoscope first thing in the morning because they want to know what's what's going to happen that day no one really likes surprises um and that just plays in our with our nature um so I do understand why individuals have the needs to know their future. I feel that our future is not predetermined. I know that our future is not predetermined. Otherwise, it would be so boring. <laughs> it was so boring. <laughs> it would be as if we would have free will. And I believe we do have free will. And that's actually so, free will is embedded in every single religion. That is so bad. And oh. astrology is so pervasive in Indian society that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, um, for example, I mean, uh, Astrology, as, as you said, there is, uh, you know, people have morning coffee and then they also look at morning horoscope in the newspaper, if, if they have a newspaper or they even, they even get alerts these days, you know, from apps. <laughs> this is your horoscope. <laughs> uh, and they're, uh, they're advancing too. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, just, uh, just an example. There was a time where I had three or four different apps for horoscopes on my phone on purpose. Because every time people were asking me, uh, oh, do you do astrology? Do you believe in astrology? I would ask them their, their sign and they would tell me and then I would read every single prediction from the apps that were completely different. And I would, tell, <laughs> I would tell them, you know, so the bottom line is just sit down, do absolutely nothing today and we'll talk again tomorrow. Is this... <laughs> And it's so pervasive that you have <laughs> astrologers who go on predicting elections, and uh, they they not just predict you know or in a local or federal elections in mm -hmm. India. Uh, there was one astrologer who recently passed away uh, who predicted uh, uh, even the U.S. presidential election of 2016, and like all pollsters, he predicted that uh, you know uh, um, Hillary Clinton would win. 
but unfortunately planets are not in our favor i mean they did not don their blessings upon us so we we all know what happened um so the astrologer was wrong so as all the pols all the pollsters all you know all of those including uh 538 and everyone I and mean, who made these predictions and Even interestingly with elections when you're having to deal with groups of people that are satisfied or dissatisfied your chance of getting the especially when you have two candidates the the chance of getting your predictions right is 50% So it's so I mean we, we would rather we, we can even you know toss a coin I mean rather than going to an astrologer and pay pay that's pretty much the same right. as <laughs> So uh, and and it is so per- and even the extent of uh, influence of astrology so much that uh, marriages are uh, pretty much based out on astro- astrology ast- uh, on their horoscopes So in India a lot of marriages are uh, predominant whole in the last l- lot of marriages are still arranged marriages so and where uh, the main criteria of even proceeding with a match uh, is is whether their horoscopes are compatible or not so um, astrologers do actually have a lot of power or, or a lot of control over people's life people have family astrologers they might not even have family doctors but they have family astrologers so and and when it comes to when you, when you i think you mentioned you know uh, the thing about belief and fact and you know dealing with uncertainty in life and ironically uh, the profession that deals with uncertainty on everyday basis the science profession in india uh, if you look at isro uh, indian space research organization so whenever they uh, launch a launch a rocket it is very it's very customary uh, for them to you know take uh, you know to uh, to get an auspicious time set up for this and uh, recently uh, when when chandrayaan 2 ha- happened so uh, the head of uh, isro dr shivan uh, he was he went to um, you know uh, I, th- i think the head of a ho- he went to a holy seer uh, and um, you know and and then got uh, an auspicious time set up uh, for for the launch of the rocket and anyway the i mean the mission was uh, uh, the the probe did not land on the moon it was unsuccessful and the, um, so uh, but but that has no bearing on this fact of uh, you know having an auspicious time for this so when you see things like this where leaders uh, in top elite scientific institutions of india which is largely still a scientifically illiterate country uh, a society mm-hmm. uh, where you see these kind of things happening where you know they bring in astrology they bring in auspicious times from all these things into into this thing say for example you you know you send a rocket to mars to study it it's called mangalyan and the same mars the same mangal Uh, in your horoscope it actually destroys your marriage and you you set up an and you as a leader of uh, you know of, of the of the rocket of the rocket institute that's sending this rocket you know you set up an auspicious, auspicious time uh, to please mars or to please saturn i don't know i mean may you want a gravitational sling <laughs> maybe you want to please saturn then so uh, the thing what do you make out of this i mean do you think uh, scientists and leaders in science uh, they need to keep these things separate their personal beliefs and uh, professional Uh, etiquette professional commitments uh, do you think they should keep separate what do you see i mean when stuff like this happens uh, in a country like india not just in a country like india in every country on the planet we are human that's what i'm going to tell you and as humans we represent not only our present but also our past and our past is very uh, and in our past culture is very embedded um you know uh, have you here in in the in the US or even in Europe black cats are considered to be bad luck and this has nothing to do with the poultry lines they are still cuddly and wonderful and pretty to play with and still everybody hates black cats um is that logical no does it have any roots to science definitely no are we still considering it right is even a reaction when you see first see a black cat crossing in front of you god forbid now that you go back and you stay home um yes because it's part of our culture it's part of our bringing um i do understand how there is a a um, a puzzle in your mind on how can individuals who are so smart there they are live and breathe science also be superstitious this way right uh, but at the same time again it's part of our culture you you cannot remove that it's the same reason why sometimes when um 
uh, you set a foundation of a building, you ask a priest to bless the building. Does this have to do with the building itself or how good it's going to be or how sturdy it's going to be? The answer is no. It's just people feel much better when something like that happens simply because it comes from their past. Um, I would respect this kind of activity simply again as a cultural norm and definitely not blame a, a technological failure to bad alignment of stars. <laughs> so, you know, if, if uh, missions are successful, et cetera, et cetera, we need to recognize there's a human hand in there. There's some kind of a, a failure or, or something we do not predict. It always happens that when it's successful, the credit goes to the credit goes to the planets and if it is failure a credit goes to the human <laughs> blame Oopsie. goes to you <laughs> that's not fair is this <laughs> <That's laughs> uh, give, give credit and failure words to um, again in as much as i don't believe in that or you know i don't think that this is scientifically substantial or substantiated let's respect culture as well it's just and i love black hats by the way <laughs> poor little things um, so it, it's something similar. I, yeah, I hear you. I, I do feel that there is a, a little bit of an extreme in um, the attention that astrologers are, are being given. But again, this is part of your culture. You, you can't rip it away from it. What you can do is actually contain it. Uh, you know, this astrology doesn't have to do with science. And I'm pretty sure there's more than astrology when it comes to marriages. Parents are very careful, very hawkish when it comes to knowing who their kids are going to be with. So share hmm. more power to youngsters like Teja, who, who can pull others into the field of science that can hey, break can this. Please? It's it's uh, it's up to people like Teja, yeah, to young individuals like Teja, who can just separate the two. But again, let's celebrate our past, right? Yeah. We can't eliminate. We should not eliminate it. I mean, in India, you have such an amazing culture that has provided influences all over the world. So, right? It's I come from a country with a, a huge culture as well. Greece has been one of the inspirations of the Western civilization. But think about it, we don't believe in the 12 gods of, of mythology anymore. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, th I think, yeah, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, conserv uh, conserving culture is one thing. And, uh, you know, again, mm -hmm. figuring out which parts of the culture are relevant and which parts of culture are going to take us forward is one thing and which exactly. parts we have to leave and yeah. dismantle or something else i think uh, yeah and again, you know that's people, there connect, everywhere. Yeah. people connect through culture so if uh if a scientist needs to evoke astrology in order to have people listen to them about a process that happens in nature i'm fine with that i am because you know at some point you need to the, the two to move together at some point um, astrology will actually find its own peace <laughs> while science will prevail. So, so, so you're saying there is a natural process uh, in which astrology will become decadent and get th and gets thrown into trash <laughs> by society when it when it evolves. Uh, so. Let's let's see how society evolves. And yeah, Dr. I think Kafka can get can get tired of things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and now let's uh, let's have some uh, rapid fire questions. I mean, this is uh, this okay. is a bit of fun part in the show. Uh, so uh, we are going to play a game. Uh, it's called uh, uh, "Is this overrated or is this underrated or is this accurately rated?" So uh, so, okay. so we are going to tell you something. So you can you can just say whether it is overrated or underrated or yeah, it, it is rated pretty well, pretty much uh, in the, accurately. Uh, so the first thing is uh, the hype around finding aliens. Intelligent beings, you know. So, is it is it overrated? Overrated, think... overrated with a promise. So, can I be between? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> because you know we're we're seriously looking for alien life forms, but you know no UFOs came to abduct anyone. Anyway, so. Alien life is really important. Yeah. And uh, what about electrical vehicles? Do you think they're overrated or accurately rated? Are underrated. Accurately rated for the problems they're providing. They're, we're not going to have electric. Uh, electrical vehicles are actually helping with gas emissions. 
So you think IC engines by and large will be replaced by EVs in in a way in a like no, ten years or I'm fifteen years? I'm hoping if we can change if we can change the infrastructure all over the world, so we can actually charge them. <laughs> <laughs> Every gas station needs to be a charging station, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about uh, the movie Interstellar? Is it overrated or underrated? What do you think? I've never seen it. I refused. Oh. I, I <laughs> because some of after right after it came out, some of my colleagues were complaining about the science faux pas in that movie. And when a movie uh, slaughters science so badly, I just refused. The one that I really like is actually um, Carl Sagan's Contact. Contact. Thank you. Jody I Foster. I I can forget that. I can forgive that one. But other than that, I, mm -mm, no. So even Martian, you uh, so is do you, you think it's it's uh? It I watched the Martian. I had to cringe through half of it because, but it's not like it's, mm -mm. simply because everyone, you know, he was so highly rated. Uh, so uh, what, what, what did you think was cringeworthy? I mean, I thought, uh, you know, depending on potatoes was cringeworthy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Even the way that you, know, you have a, a vehicle that is dead, um, you know, solar panels, etc. You just go and dust them and they start working. <laughs> 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 dust goes everywhere. It's not just the panels, the electronics, etc. You know, that. And then the whole bio thing. Uh, about his um, survive no and even communication between earth and Mars. No. okay let's forget that movie next <laughs> <laughs> and uh, cats as pets do you think it's overrated cats as pets are overrated or underrated i love pets period so it's just right <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and what do you think of uh, colonizing mars do you think it's overrated or underrated no, but it's going to be a very boring place to live and very restrictive. I love, love, love exploring our planet. So if you want to go colonize Mars, send me a postcard if you can. <laughs> Do you think we can nuke Mars and then make it habitable and grow algae or, you know? Nuke Mars and make it habitable. Uh, that, oh my that, God. That, so, that's Elon Musk's so... <laughs> dream. I... <laughs> it's okay. So let me translate this, right? So we're going to take a planet that has a little bit of atmosphere, but eventually, potentially, within the next 500 years, could host life. You're going to take a, a nuclear warhead and throw it on there. So on top of not having a lot of atmosphere, it's going to be <laughs> nuclear active with a radioactive decay, like a Chernobyl, but in a larger scale. And you expect people to go survive there. Oh, Elon Musk bets on it. I mean, he he says, you know, yeah, we can nuke Musk. Why not? <laughs> Since Elon Musk said it, it must be true. <laughs> oh God, it's a hype. Uh, yeah, it's so it's, hype. it's 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 highly overrated. Okay, and uh, and what about uh, human level artificial intelligence? Do you think it's overrated or underrated? You have to remember, art artificial intelligence in principle is machine learning. So whatever you, you feed the code, the code is going to give you. So I think it's just right. We, it's, it's working well enough now for the problems we wanted to, to solve. And hopefully it's going to work even better um, as we, we keep feeding it. But it's not exactly intelligent. I, th I think that we are, we are confusing ourselves by using a word that is, um, that is very well recognized and um, it's we should call it model optimization. Yeah. Model optimization again, machine learning. That is that is actually the the right word. But do you think? But do you think you know we'll we'll have someday you know uh, uh, robots? You know, I mean, in the sense that you know, I mean, you you heard of this Turing test? Do you think you know you know machines could pass this Turing test one day? I mean, we would we would not really recognize whether it's a human or an animal, or sorry, tests, or a machine that's interacting with us. Tests are made by humans. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and they're very specific. So a machine might actually learn how to solve tests or, or do things like, sure. Uh, and they might do it faster because again, the algorithm might get faster and we have a better CPUs in the future, sure. I mean, they're, they're spinning big Bitcoin right now. <laughs> Why couldn't they do um, problem solving? And that is the reason for machine learning. It's problem, problem solving and 
um, analyzing huge data sets within a time frame that we can actually make something out of them. And how did, uh, I mean, can you uh, tell us how, you know, machine learning or, you know, uh, that, that revolutionized, uh, that changed astronomy um, in your field? It's, uh, it's all about, again, processing large sets of data, but even though the human eye can identify um, uh, abnormalities and special um, phenomena that the machine cannot capture. So for example, there have been lots of old sky surveys, right? And their, their goal was to actually classify galaxies. So you have to actually feed the machine what exactly a galaxy should look like. And based on the, the um, appearance, it would actually classify it as a spiral or elliptical. But at the same time, even a machine cannot tell, you know, the inclination of the galaxy and um, whether the galaxy has more structure or less structure, things like that. So that's why there was a, a citizen science project out there uh, called the Galaxy Zoo, um, which actually invited citizen scientists to classify galaxies and classify them in a much more uh, rigorous way, more detailed. Um, so astronomy has been uh, a pioneer, if not anything else, when it comes to machine learning and data, but still the al algorithms are evolving. And again, if you want to capture the, the interesting objects, they're usually the ones that are not necessarily classifiable within a specific category. You really need to take a, a look with your eyes on, on those objects. The same thing with variable stars, right? You, you mm. feed a specific shape of a light curve, and then you, you know, it just goes up and down, or it's flat and then goes down, or something like that. But how about everything in between? And these two things become very interesting. And then finally, um, uh, spirituality, do you think it's overrated or underrated or accurately rated? I think it's as accurately rated, it's just right. Uh, it becomes overrated only when it completely controls human lives and it uh, does not allow us to live a fulfilled life. It, it makes us live in fear, for example, our lives, and that's not why we're on this planet. I am spiritual, I really am. I do believe in God and I do believe in powers that are above and beyond my own comprehension um but yeah i, I believe in love though I'm the, the god of love so it's not i'm not gonna be scared of my life <laughs> i'm not gonna live in fear that's interesting so so uh so yeah i think i think the point about uh you know having a rational thinking you know um mm -hmm. f basing you know opinions and beliefs based on on reality and reason i think that's the point, uh, I think that what that you said, I think I think it's very important, um, so that you know people you know, don't let religion or any any other supernatural stuff or any um, blind faith, you know, take control over their lives. They should be, in, yeah. they should have agency in their lives. That's an important point. We should have agency in our lives, but also we we need to recognize that we don't understand what we don't understand. There's some things that even science cannot explain for us. Definitely, Dr. Gafka, and. Um, uh, yeah, so I think um, I think we are at, uh, I think we are at the end of the show now. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Tak, uh, Dr. Uh, Kafka, so we thank you very much for your time. And we know it's uh, it's it's in the middle of night for you. I think it's close to one thirty in the morning. Um, yeah, uh, and and we really you know uh, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Josna Teja, thank do you want to like to say anything before we close the show? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sharat, uh, for giving us an opportunity to participate in this engaging discussion uh, with Dr. Kafka. And uh, I would really like Dr. Kafka to be accepting our request and being here. And it's, it's been a great pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you very much. We would and definitely like side, to collaborate with you in future too, Dr. Kafka. You know where to find me. I'm always available. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity and a big applause to all of you for the amazing job you're doing. Popularizing thank science, you. making sure that people know the value of data and uh, keep bursting myths. Thank you, Dr. Kafka. Thank you very much uh, for your time and thank you. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for the show, for listening to the show. And you thank can you. Uh, watch, you can listen to this show on uh, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts, and you can watch 
the video again on our Facebook page, Indian Humanist Official, and on our YouTube channel, Indian Official, as Indian Humanist as well. And we welcome all, uh, all of you to work with Science for Society and the Indian Humanist and Saha uh, for building a culture of science and upholding our, uh, the Constitution of India, our fundamental duty of Article 51 AH to promote uh, scientific inquiry, a spirit of reason, the spirit of scientific inquiry and, and humanism in, in India. Thank you. Thank you, Aninda.